personalities. Of course, an amana or a trust can take many different forms. A word is a trust. Some money is a trust. A piece of business is a trust. And therefore, the trustworthy personality is somebody who people seek to be around. For they are personalities who are seen as being role models for many in the community. And the fact is that a strong community is one where there is much trust between the people, between each other's actions and each other's words. There is trust constantly. However, the opposite of a trustworthy personality is somebody who is, of course, untrustworthy. And an untrustworthy personality is somebody who is always full of deceit. Somebody who is willing to bribe and is willing to forge and at times is willing to steal. And somebody who people will always watch what they say in front of. Why? Because an untrustworthy personality is somebody who is ready to change the words of even his own Muslim brethren. Or is somebody who is willing to change a deal even though the deal was begun with trust. And that's why we find that the religion of Islam was built on honesty, integrity, and trust. And that the aim of Rasul Allah and the aim of every prophet of God is that when they go to any community, they sought to build their trustworthy nature and their reputation with the people of that community. That's why we find the famous phrase which says, it takes years to build trust. And it takes seconds to destroy it. Many times in our life, it takes us years to build ourselves as trustworthy personalities in the community that we live in. As in, it doesn't begin right from the beginning. Sometimes we have to deal and interact, and only then we are revered as trustworthy personalities. But it could take seconds to destroy it. One bad act, one bad financial deal, one bad word we use, and all of a sudden that honesty is gone. Indeed, one lie and it's gone. The famous philosopher Nietzsche used to say, I'm not upset that you lied to me. I'm rather upset that I can't trust you anymore. And the idea that was given here is that it's not so much I care that you've now lied to me. I now cannot even listen to you without thinking twice. Because they say trust is like a vase. Once it's broken, you can fix it again. But it will never look the same. When you have a vase in your house, that vase, when it breaks, you bring some glue and you bring it together and it sticks. But the crack is still there and you will never forget that crack. Therefore, when we look at the religion of Islam, the best of Muslims is judged by his trustworthiness. The more trustworthy they are in their interaction, the more they are revered. That's why there was a report in one of the American newspapers a couple of years ago about a trustworthy cab driver in America. As you know, in New York and the New Jersey area, cab drivers are a plenty. The famous New York taxi driver or cab driver is something which is known about and spoken about by many. There was a cab driver by the name of Abdul Majid Al Imami who was taking somebody towards an Atlantic City in New Jersey. Now, we shouldn't know about Atlantic City. Because it's a place where many people go and indulge in things maybe we shouldn't. But let's just say it's a place where people go with a lot of money. The person went to, who was in the back of this cab with $2,085. And he had it in an envelope. He came out of the cab and left the $2,085 at the back. Now if this Muslim was not trustworthy, he'd turn around and say, Ya Allah, this is my rizq today. Let me take the 2,000 and take my family on a nice holiday. But instead, what did he do? He went back to the Hilton at Atlantic City. And he said that I uh, came and dropped someone by the name of Bill Jesse. And here is his $2,085 which I've come to give him. The report was all over the American newspapers. Why? Because his lines were, when he was asked, why didn't you take the money? He said, because in the religion of Islam, the most important characteristic is trustworthiness. In Islam, we are revered for being ameen and looking after the amana that we are given. And therefore, this was an amana that was given to us by whom? That was given to us by this man. I have come to give it back. Of course, the American only gave him $100 for what he did. But there you go. There are some countries which are like this. 
But the point was that he returned his money back as a trust. That's why in the story of Prophet Yusuf, the story of Prophet Yusuf highlights to us how Prophet Yusuf in his development as a prophet of God recognized the importance of trust in four different areas in one's life. Trust between family, trust between community, trust with non-Muslims, and trust as a leader of Allah on earth. The four most important areas of amanat in our life are between our family and between our f- community and between the non-Muslims who we interact with and between ourselves as Allah's reps on earth. Let me explain. The first lesson he learned about amanat was with his family. In which way? Anyone thinks that they are with their family, that the most amanat they will be shown would be between their family members. As in when I grew up with my brother, or with my sisters, or with my mother, or with my father, I would think to myself that they would look after me as a trust that they would see me as their younger brother or as their cousin and they would respect me. But even if they had a problem with me, they wouldn't get too angry. Rather, they would say, look, we have a problem. Either we resolve this problem here or we find a different solution. Prophet Yusuf found in his life that from the outset, when there is a lack of amanat between family members, it can destroy the family. And how did he find this? He, of course, had 11 brothers. He saw a dream where they were all prostrating before him. He knew the interpretation of that dream. His brothers, out of envy of this gift that he had, what did they do? They started saying that we are an Osba. Osba means we are like a gang. There's 11 of us and there's one of him. Because sometimes in a family of 5 or 6 or 7, You think to yourself that us five are here and there's one. Us five can defeat that one. Let's just get together as a gang. History repeats itself. So they said, we will get together and we will defeat him. They came to the father. They said, oh Prophet Yaqub, let us take him out to play with him. Prophet Yaqub did not trust them. He knew that they had other intentions. So he said, are you going to look after him? They said, of course, he's our brother. How will we not look after him? They took him out and they said, we just want to play some racing with him. You know, you go to the park, you race with your brothers and so on. When they went, one group of them said, let's kill him. Imagine, their father placed him as an amana. He placed him as a trust between the sons. But what did the sons do? The sons went against this trust and they took that son and one of them said, let's kill him. The other said, no, we'll throw him in a well. They threw him in a well until eventually a caravan going towards Egypt saved him and took him towards Egypt. The first level of amana he recognized was between family. That if there is no amana between family members, then there is destruction in the community. Number one. Number two, the second amana he saw, which was important, was between community members. Why? Because he recognized that we all live outside our family as well as within our family. Therefore, there has to be as much trust outside the family as there is within the family. When he reached Egypt, he recognized that he was a slave. Eventually, the Aziz of Egypt bought him. When the Aziz bought him, his wife said, we will take him either as our adopted son or we will take him as our servant. He now saw that they had taken him as a trust. He had nobody. They had taken him as a trust. What did they do? They employed him as a servant within the house. The Aziz would sometimes leave the house and go to his work. Because the Aziz was the treasurer of Egypt. He would leave the house and go to work. Yusuf would be left alone at home with Zulaikha. Here, Zulaikha was taken by the beauty of Prophet Yusuf. As in, she had never seen anybody as beautiful in her life. She had two options. Either she could look after him and not do anything, or she would trap him in the room and say, whatever you want, I will give you. When she did make that offer to Prophet Yusuf, Prophet Yusuf knew 
that amana in family is one thing, but amana with members of the community is another. He could have easily thought that the Aziz is outside the house. I will now go with his wife and nobody will know. <coughs> but he recognized that there is a trust between the members of the community. So he said to her, I will not come near you. Why? Because your husband was honorable to me. He trusted me in the house alone with his wife. Therefore, I'm not going to break his trust. Number two. Number three, he recognized the importance of trust where with non-Muslims. Why? Because the king wanted him to be the treasurer of Egypt. The king was not a Muslim. The king, on the contrary, did not even believe, according to certain hadith, in God. Nabi Yusuf, however, recognized that just because someone does not believe in what I believe, does not mean I go against them when they offer me a trust. Nor does it mean that they are untrustworthy people. No, he is the king. He wants to employ me as the economic minister of Egypt. No problem. He has given me a trust. I will look after this trust. Because there is no harm placing a trust with a non-Muslim. And there is no harm protecting the trust of non-Muslims. Number three. Number four, he saw the importance of amana when you lead the community. Why? Because when he was made economic minister of Egypt, do you know what he said to the king? The king wanted him as an economic minister. Nabi Yusuf said, I will not be your economic minister until you clear me of the scandal with Zulaikha. Why? Because still on the shoulders of Yusuf, people thought... That he was the one who ran after Zulaikha. Not Zulaikha ran after him. Nabi Yusuf the king said to him, I want you to be my economic minister. Nabi Yusuf said, I'd prefer to be in prison than to be your economic minister with a reputation in the community. Clear this reputation, then I will take the trust of being a leader. Because when you become the leader of the community, for people to trust you, you cannot have a bad reputation. You need to be someone whose reputation is crystal clear. The king went, he investigated, until now the rumor was removed. It wasn't Yusuf who ran after Zulaikha. It was Zulaikha who ran after Yusuf. These four areas highlight to us that they are the most important areas of amana in our lives. That when we live in the 21st century... The most important areas of amana are number one with our family, number two with the community, number three with non-Muslims, and number four when we are placed as leaders of the community. Let's examine these one by one and see how they affect our lives today. Number one, the first and most important form of amana is with the family members. Meaning what? Meaning that the most important trust in our lives is with our family. As in a person who has a family which they can trust, is a person who rests in their house. Is a person who does not look over their shoulders. As in, when we look at building our families, the most important characteristic that we have to look at is trustworthiness. That's why, Nabi Shu'ayb, when he looked for someone to marry his daughter, the most important characteristic he looked for was that the future spouse was someone who was Amin. Why? Because as we know, today in the world, there are people who look for someone who is economically strong. There are people who look for someone, for example, who has a big bank balance. There are people who look for someone who has a shahada, a degree. But the problem is, what's the point if economically they are strong but they have no trustworthiness when they're going to look after your daughter. As in, what's the point of him having lots of money, but that money has no trustworthiness in the way he behaves with your daughter? When Nabi Shuaib's daughter came back from having met Nabi Musa, she came back and she said, قالت يا أبت استأجر إن خير من استأجرت القوي الأمين my father employ Musa. He said to her, why? She said, because he is strong and he is trustworthy. 
she, he said to her, how do you know he is strong? She said, because he lifted some water which others could not lift. She said to, he said to her, how do you know he is trustworthy? She said, because on the way back when we were walking, he wouldn't walk ahead of me. He walked, he wouldn't walk behind me. He walked ahead of me. He said, so what do you mean? She said he would pick up some pebble and he'd say, these pebbles, flick them in front of me. Where that pebble falls, I will know is the direction. She said, I said to him, why? We can walk alongside each other or you can walk behind me. He said, you are not mahram to me. So there is no way we should converse with each other. Today they converse over the MSN like you think they are boyfriend and girlfriend. Ten years before they've even married each other. And then when they divorce, the people ask why? Because of course it starts in the wrong way. Here, his most important attribute to Prophet Shu'aib was that he was Amin. And trustworthiness was what Shu'aib looked for. He didn't want his daughter to go in the hands of somebody who has no trust. That's why Rasulullah used to say, there is no trustworthy wife like Um Salama. Um Salama wanted to join in Hadith al kisa But Rasulullah said, this is for these five. You are good. But this Hadith al kisa this kisa which you enter, is for these five. But he used to say, no wife is as trustworthy as Um Salama. That's why when Amir al-Mu'mineen left Medina to go towards Kufa, he left some papers with Um Salama. When he died, Imam al-Hasan went back to Medina. Um Salama gave the papers to Imam al-Hasan. When Imam al Hussein left Medina to go towards Kufa, he left some papers with Um Salama. When Imam Zain al-Abideen returned back to Medina, he took the papers from Um Salama. Um Salama used to have a son by the name of Umar ibn Muqran. He was her son from a different husband. He was the one who Ali ibn Abi Talib named his son Umar after. Ali ibn Abi Talib had a son called Umar. Many people asked, why did he name his son Umar? Because of Umar ibn Muqran, the son of Um Salama. Umar ibn Muqran was such a pious son that Ali ibn Abi Talib made him one of his generals in the battle of Jamal against the opposition. Umar ibn Muqran narrates that when I was sitting with my mother when she married Rasulullah, Rasulullah one day said to her, Um Salama, I want you to go and get me something. I want to write something. She said to him, no problem. She went and got him a piece of sheepskin. She says, Rasulullah began to write. And he wrote something and he said to me, Um Salama, you are the trustworthy wife. I want you to look after this trust until one day somebody is going to come and take it from you. Um Salama said, that he wrote something down. I didn't know what it was. She said that I waited and waited until her son Umar says, we waited until Ali ibn Abi Talib became Khalifa. When Ali ibn Abi Talib became Khalifa, he went up on the pulpit, he announced his Khalifa, then he came down. When he came down, he said, Umar, tell your mother I want to come to her house. I want her permission to pick something up. Umar says that I wondered, could this be the day that the amana of Rasulullah finally gets given to Ali ibn Abi Talib? Says that Ali ibn Abi Talib came to our house, Um Salama gave him that which Rasulullah gave her. She had not opened it until Ali ibn Abi Talib came. When Ali ibn Abi Talib came, he took it from her. He said, Um Salama, did your husband Rasulullah give you something as an amana? She said, yes. He said, can I have it? She said, take it. He opened it. Do you know what was written? Do not forsake Ali ibn Abi Talib, for he is the imam after me, after I die. Imagine. That this amana she kept, she did not open until Amir al-Mu'mineen became Khalifa. These are the types of wives we want in our families. That when we say something to them, they don't tell the whole world about what's happening in our life. Because sometimes when our relationships break, it's because of a lack of amana in the way one part of the relationship goes and tells the world about everything that's happening. No. An amana is that the wife protects 
until she is allowed to give. That's why if a family does not have amana between them, that family is bound to be destroyed. Especially, it is ironic, if you name your son Amin, but he destroys your trust you have given him. Harun al-Rashid had two sons, al-Amin and al-Ma'moon. Amin means the trustworthy. Ma'moon means the one who is given trust. Harun al-Rashid named those two sons because he thought that after I die, I have two sons who are my glorious sons. They are the most trustworthy people. Surely they would not break my trust. Amin was the son of Zubaydah, Harun al-Rashid's first wife. Ma'moon was the son of Murajil, a black slave girl who Harun al-Rashid married. When Harun al-Rashid died, he said, my successor in my family is Al-Amin. When he dies, it will be Al-Ma'moon. So he said to him, Amin, do you understand this? He said, yes. He said, are you taking my amana? You are my family. Don't break my amana. He said, of course I wouldn't break your amana. As soon as Harun al-Rashid died, Al-Amin said, there is no way Al-Ma'moon will succeed me. The succession will go to my son Musa. They said to him, but you are Al-Ameen, the trustworthy. Your father trusted you with a succession. He said, I do not care. My father is now dead. And I do not care that he calls me Ameen. I want my son Musa to succeed me. Al-Ma'moon was the governor of Khurasan. The whole of Persia was his. Whereas Al-Ameen was controlling Baghdad. And Amin thought to himself that, you know what? I'm going to finish the son of the black slave girl. Because he looked down at his brother. He said, you're the son of a black slave girl. I'm the son of Zubaydah, one of the greatest Arabs. Let me finish you. So he began to send soldiers to finish Al-Ma'moon. Al-Ma'moon thought, is he trying to mess about with me? Does he not know how powerful I am? Al-Ma'moon thought that this is my blood brother. The biggest amana should be between us. But sometimes blood brothers are the worst of enemies. Sometimes blood brothers are the ones when an amana is in their hands, it causes them to hate each other rather than love each other. For goodness sake, your name is Amin. You are meant to be trustworthy. No. He sent people to kill his brother. al Ma'moon. you know, he had a general by the name of Tahir ibn al Hussein. He said to Tahir, he said, Tahir, you are my general. I want you to take an army towards Baghdad and destroy Al-Amin. One brother wants to kill the other because of power. He sent Tahir ibn Hussein. Tahir ibn Hussein, one by one, started to cause discord between the soldiers of Al-Amin. Until eventually, he reached Al-Anbar gate in Baghdad. When he reached that gate, Al-Amin found out that Tahir ibn Hussein has now entered Baghdad. He tried to flee. Tahir ibn al-Hussein found out that al-Amin, from being the emperor of the whole of Islam, was now on a boat trying to run away. He caught the boat. He brought him to Ambar gate. He beheaded him. And al-Ma'moon became Khalifa. History shows us that if there is no amana in a family, then that family will finish. If there is amana in that family, then that family remains strong. These two brothers, like the brothers of Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam, because there was no trust, the family was destroyed. Number one. Number two, the second area of amana is the amana in a community. Meaning what? Meaning in a community, sometimes we feel that we can trust our brothers. We give our brothers a loan, we expect the loan to come back to us. And then somebody comes to me and says, Sayyid Ammar, will you borrow me a thousand dollars? My business is not doing well. I reply to them by saying what? I'll give you a thousand dollars, but you have to give it back to me over a certain period of time. As in, I expect that that amana will come back to me. But you find that sometimes in communities, you trust somebody with an amana and they do not return it to you at all. That sometimes between Muslims, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah 4 verse 58, Inna Allah ya'murakum. And to add amanati ila ahliha. Allah orders you that you return your amanat to their trust. When somebody gives you a trust, you must return it. Number one, 
Number two, then Allah tells us, between your community members, when you go in business with each other, don't sell each other something which is bad, and then later on say, I didn't know about it. These two directions were given to us in the Quran. The number one, when somebody gives you an amana, return the amana. Yet every day in the Muslim community, there is a trouble between two people because of amana. Somebody lends somebody some money, that amana does not return back to them at all. I remember in the time of Azad al dawla one of the Khalifa, he was the Khalifa of the Islamic State. In his time, many people used to come to Baghdad from the Muslims. They used to say, if we come to Baghdad, we will be able to exchange between our community, as in everybody thinks, your own Muslim brother would not deceive you. One of these people came to Baghdad, Baghdad was the center of trade. He came with a necklace worth a thousand dirham. He wanted to sell this necklace. When he wanted to sell the necklace, nobody was buying it. It was now the time for Hajj. He wanted to go to Hajj. He left the necklace with one of the most pious people in the community. He thought, I'll leave it with him. When I come back from Hajj, give me my necklace. When he left it, he went to Hajj, returned back. He came to the pious person. He said to him, excuse me, can I have my necklace back? The person said, which necklace? He said, you know the necklace I left behind for you before I went to Hajj? He said, I don't remember any necklace. He said, excuse me, the necklace, 1,000 dirhams. I left it with you. He said, I don't remember. Do you know why this happened? Because they didn't write when a loan happened. Instead, it was a verbal agreement. And verbal agreements do not get you anywhere in life. The Quran said, Ya ayyuha alladheena amanu, Ida tadayantum bidaynin, When you take a loan from someone, Ila ajalin musamman faktubuh, Whoever it is, write it down. I have taken a loan, be it your brother or a member of the community. Why? Because when it is verbal, it is interpreted in a different way. You end up hating each other. He didn't write it down. It came back. He said to him, these are my thousand. He said, I'm sorry. This person was clever. Why? Because he knew Azad al was known for his honesty and his trustworthiness. The king. He went to the king. He said to him, excuse me, O king. I have not come from Baghdad. I have come to Baghdad. I came with a thousand dollar necklace, thousand din- a dirham necklace. When I came, I left it with this grocer. Now this grocer will not give it back to me. I said, did you write it, the contract? No. I said, why? Then Rasulullah said, write anything you give, write it. Don't just make it verbal. He said, I didn't. He said, okay, don't worry about it. I'm going to come for three days in a row outside that green grocer's place. On the fourth day, I'm going to say something to you. Pretending I know you. Then your necklace will come back to you. So he came. On the first day, he didn't say anything. Second, he didn't say anything. Third day. Fourth day, that person was standing in the market. Suddenly the king said, Oh, so and so, what are you doing in Baghdad? How could you come to Baghdad without staying in my residence? My palace is waiting for you. And you stay in Baghdad without me. Wallah, I'm embarrassed. I am the king. We've known each other's families for years. And you do not come and tell me. Suddenly that greengrocer with the necklace thought, who is this guy? As in the, the king is telling him, why don't you stay in the palace? The king kept on saying, we respect you. We respect your family. Is there a problem? He said, I'm looking for my necklace, but somebody is not giving it to me. Straight away that greengrocer came next to him. He said, excuse me, your necklace, what did it look like exactly? He said to him, now you tell me what did it look like? He said, no, no, I want to know because maybe I might have it. Accidentally, you might have dropped it near me. Because the problem in our communities is, when two people quarrel, you find they won't resolve the issue. It needs an influential member always to come in. We can't have integrity and honesty between ourselves. Why do we always need to use an alim or a speaker or the president to settle an issue? Why is it that the Muslims themselves do not have the trustworthiness between themselves? The second problem in the community is what? Between a community, when there is no amana, then you find that that community is open for destruction. 
That's why not only is there no amana between loans, sometimes we sell each other something. I sell you a car. I know there's a problem in the engine. But if there's a problem in the engine, I said, I'm sorry, we didn't make the agreement at the beginning. This type of untrustworthiness in the community exists until today. Where people sell each other products, the first person knows there's a problem in his product. But he doesn't say, that poor person who bought it then finds out and does not get his money back. Rasulullah used to walk in Medina. When he's walking in Medina, sometimes he'd want to buy something. One day he wanted to buy some corn. He put his money, his hand in the corn to take some out. Suddenly he recognized that his hand became wet. He said, why is the corn wet? They replied to him, the corn is wet, the person said, because it was raining yesterday. Therefore, there is some corn which is wet. He said to him, why don't you put the wet corn at the top? Why are you selling corn, putting the good at the top and the bad at the bottom? If you are a trustworthy trader, you would always make sure that you tell your customer that there, some of this corn is wet and some of it is good. So that there isn't a problem between two Muslims. That's why Surah Al-Mutaffafeen, Surah 83, Waylun lil Mutaffafeen. Mutaffafeen, do you know who they are? They sell you something they know has a problem. Then later on when you come back to them, they say to you what? They say, I'm sorry, you didn't ask. If you asked, I would have told you. In Islam, that is mistrust between the community. Number three, in that same community, when you are going to give a loan, there are some in the world today who give loans as a form of trust. Then Muslims charge each other interest. Allahu Akbar. You tell him, I'm going to give you some loan. 18, 20, 30, 40, 100, 75, a million thousand dollars. You tell him. Then when he pays it back late, you suddenly increase the figure by 200,000. Why? Interest? Why didn't you pay me back on time? That destroys communities. Why? Because interest shows a lack of trust between community members. And the Quran says it's a war between Allah and His Prophet. It's a war against Allah and His Prophet. Therefore, the second type of amana is in the community. The third type of amana is between us and non-Muslims. Why? Because there are certain people who say, we shouldn't engage in business with non-Muslims. You ask them why? They say, because a non-Muslim, you can't trust him. I tell you, there are non-Muslims who are more trustworthy than Muslims. And do you know who says this? The Quran. In Surah 3, verse 75. وَمِنْ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ مَنْ هُوْ بِقِنْطَارٍ يُؤَدِّهِ إِلَيْكِ وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ إِنْتَأْمَنْهُ بِدِينَارٍ لَا يُؤَدِّهِ إِلَيْكِ You see what the Quran said? There are some from the people of the book, the Jews and the Christians. When you give him as much kilograms of gold, he looks after it and he gives it to you like you gave it to him. And there are others, you give him one dinar of gold, he doesn't give it back to you at all. Do you know who this verse was revealed about? Two Jews in Arabia. Rasulullah said one of them is the most trustworthy man in Arabia. And the other of them, no. The other of them is not. The first one was called Abdullah ibn Salam. Abdullah ibn Salam was a Jew. But all the Muslims used to give him their trust because of how trustworthy he was. What to the extent he used to look after 840 kilograms of gold of the Muslims. How many? 840 kilograms of gold. When a Muslim would want his gold back, he would give it kilogram by kilogram exactly as it was. Then there was another Jew by the name of Fanas. The Muslims, you would give him one dinar of gold. You go back for that one dinar. He says, which dinar? You've never given me. Then on top of that, do you know what he says? He says, I'm a Jew. You're a Muslim. We don't need to give to people like you. We only give to our own. The point the Qur'an was making was what? One of the most important trust is with non-Muslims. Why? Number one, some non-Muslims are more trustworthy than Muslims in your own community. 
Otherwise, Rasulullah would not say that you can give him 840 kilograms of gold and it would come back to you. But number two, the importance of Islam is judged by its reputation and its contracts. If I show trust with a non-Muslim, they will come to the religion of Islam because of my akhlaq when I deal in a contract. If, however, I break my trust, you'll find that no one will come towards the religion of Islam. That's why, do you know the Quraysh, even though they were not Muslim, they would leave their trust with Rasulullah. Do you know why? Because the title of Rasulullah was what? Al-Sadiq Al-Ameen. Do you know why he got this title Al-Ameen? The title Al-Ameen was given to him by the non-Muslims, not by the Muslims. It was given to him when Hajar al-Aswad was placed in the Kaaba. Because in Arabia, there was a major flood that occurred in Arabia. A major flood. This flood affected the whole of Mecca. And the flood came all the way down to the Kaaba. It made the Kaaba have certain problems in its structure. Number two, because the Kaaba did not have a ceiling, the flood would enter. And not only would the flood enter, but what happened was there, the treasures of the Kaaba, many thieves were now able to enter. The Kaaba needed to be restored. So the people wanted to restore it. Each of the tribes came. They started to restore the Kaaba. But then a problem occurred. Who's going to put Hajar al-Aswad in the Kaaba? Because we know Hajar al-Aswad originally, according to different narrations, came from the heavens. It came from the heavens from the time of Prophet Adam. Some hadith say it was originally pure white, but because of the sins of mankind, it became black. The angel Jibra'il gave Hajar al-Aswad to Prophet Ibrahim originally to put it in the Kaaba. But because of this flood, the cracks had appeared. Now someone had to put Hajar al-Aswad in the Kaaba. The community started fighting each other. Who puts Hajar al-Aswad? One tribe said we will put. Another tribe said we will put. A third tribe said we will put. Even Banu Abdiddar, one of the tribes of Arabia. Do you know what one of them said? He went and got the blood in a bucket of his tribe. <clears throat> Each member of the tribe put blood in the bucket. He said, we have dipped our hands in this blood. Nobody will put Hajar al-Aswad except us. And if anybody tries, we will use our blood to kill them and shed their blood. They all were quarreling who will put Hajar al-Aswad. Until the conclusion was reached by Abu Umayyah. Abu Umayyah was there. He said, listen, all of us are fighting. Tomorrow morning, the first person to enter the Kaaba will decide where Hajar al-Aswad go. The next morning, they were all waiting anxiously until someone has called out, Al-Ameen, Al-Ameen has come. Who? Rasulullah. They all shouted out, Al-Ameen, Al-Ameen, the trustworthy, let him decide. Look at the wisdom of Rasulullah. They didn't believe he was a prophet, but they called him Ameen. When he came, he looked at them, he said, what's the problem? They said, I want to put the Hajar al-Aswad. Another said, I'll put it. A third said, I'll put it. A fourth said, I'll put it. Rasulullah said, listen to me. I want you all to get a robe, a clean sheet. They all went and got the clean sheet. He said, this tribe holds one corner. This tribe holds another corner. This tribe holds a third corner. This tribe holds a fourth corner. They all held the corners. He then said, now Hajar al-Aswad, we put it in the robe. I want you all to carry the robe to the Kaaba. So all of you have a role in placing Hajar al-Aswad. They all took the robe. They reached the Kaaba. Rasulullah picked up Hajar al-Aswad and placed it. They said nobody could have sorted this issue out like Al-Ameen. Because Al-Ameen is the trustworthy. Even though we do not take his religion, there is no one as trustworthy as Muhammad. Imagine that. Number three, the importance with non-Muslims. Finally, number four, the importance of the amana of leadership. Rasulullah would never have been respected as a prophet were it not that he was trustworthy. His nature of being ameen meant everybody respected him. That's why after Rasulullah died, Khalafa had to go to somebody who was ameen. Not somebody who broke the trustworthiness of the people. Not somebody who says one thing to the people and acts another. 
Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan tells Ju'dah, the wife of Imam al-Hasan, he tells her, if you kill Hassan ibn Ali, I will give you a hundred thousand dirham and I'll give you my son Yazid. When Khalafa falls in the hands of a person who is not Amin, do not be surprised if corruption comes into the Islamic State. Because the most important characteristics of a leader is Amin. <coughs> she said to him, what will you give me? He said, a hundred thousand dirham and Yazid. He got her poison from Rome. He said to her, when Hassan ibn Ali breaks his iftar, put this with his milk and let him drink. She came on the 28th of Safar to the iftar of Imam al-Hassan. <coughs> Imam al-Hassan was about to break his fast with some milk. She put the poison in the milk. <coughs> as soon as he drank it, his color of his face changed. He said to her, O oh, enemy of Allah, why did you do what you just done? He said to her, do you trust Muawiyah bin Abi Sufyan? Do you not know you will never marry Yazid? She said to him, no. He said to me, I will marry Yazid, I trust him. Imam al-Hassan died, some ahadith say two days after, some they say 40 days after. When he died, she said to Muawiyah, let me marry Yazid. He said to what? She said, Yazid. He said, you are willing to kill the grandson of Muhammad. Do you think I'll let you marry my son? When Khalafa falls in the hands of someone who's not trustworthy, then that message of Rasulullah becomes corrupted. That's why his grandson, Muawiyah's grandson, was called Muawiyah. When he took the Khalafa, he didn't want it because of one incident. Imagine, Muawiyah took it and broke all trust. Whereas his grandson Muawiyah, Yazid called his son after his father. When his grandson Muawiyah took it, he didn't want the Khalafa. Why? This grandson of Muawiyah used to sleep with two slave girls. One of them near his head, the other near his feet. He would sleep. One day he heard them fighting each other. One of them said, my husband Muawiyah loves me because he always asks for me. The other one said, both of you will go in hell. I do not really care. He was trying to sleep. He was about to get up and strike them. All of a sudden he thought, hold on, let me listen to the conversation. What are they saying? And the reply... The other one said to her, why are you saying both of us will go in hell? She said, don't you know about his father Yazid? She said, what do you mean? She said, his father Yazid and his grandfather Muawiyah took the trust of Allah, the Khalafa on earth, away from Muhammad and Al Muhammad. And that that Khalafa belongs to Zainul Abideen. But they have not given the Khalafa back. Therefore, Allah will punish them on the day of judgment. He couldn't believe it. He thought that this that I have is a trust of Muhammad and Al Muhammad. I cannot believe this. He woke up the next morning and he said to the whole of Syria, everybody gather in the mosque. I have an announcement to make. Everybody came. People are thinking, what does the Khalifa want? He said, this Khalifa is a trust of Allah for Muhammad and Al Muhammad. And that it belongs to Imam Zainul Abideen, not me. I am not worthy of the trust of leadership for the Muslim Ummah. They couldn't believe it. Do you know what his mother said? His mother said, I wish Allah gave me the menstrual cycle so I would not have given birth to someone like you. He said to her, I wish I was not born to a mother who married the killer of Abba Abdullah al Hussein. Marwan ibn al Hakim could not believe his luck. Do you know what Marwan did? He said, Let him be, do not worry. Muawiyah stayed, the grandson of Muawiyah stayed in the palace for 40 days. Marwan ibn al-Hakam went around the corner and married his mother, the ex-wife of Yazid, after Yazid died. But then he said, he thinks the Khalafa is for Muhammad and al-Muhammad, we'll show him. He went and poisoned Muawiyah, the son of Yazid. Because they knew that that was a trust of Allah. That Allah has placed an amana, that after Rasulullah dies, that amana is to be placed in the people who looked after the sunnah of Rasulullah. Yet unfortunately, when it was placed in others, you found that it was destroyed. When Imam Zainul Abidin took the amana, he left behind a legacy in books like Risalat al Hukuk, in books like Sahifa al Sajjadiyah, in books like Dua Makarab al Akhlaq, 
to highlight the idea that the Imams of Ahl al-Bayt are the only ones who can protect the trust of Muhammad Rasulullah. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to keep us on the path of Muhammad and Al-Muhammad and to allow us to follow